So yeah, as Denise mentioned, Denise mentioned to talking about some uh, recent advances in block, block propagation and uh, why this stuff is important. So uh, as I said, why this stuff is important. I'm going to talk about how the original Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer protocol works, uh, which it doesn't work that way uh, for the most part anymore. I'm going to talk about a bit of the history of block propagation technology, the Flask Block Relay Protocol, and some other things, and then uh, building up to where the state of the art I think is today. So there's two areas that people think about when they talk about the resource usage of block propagation. One is uh, block propagation cost nodes to operate. Right? They use bandwidth to propagate blocks. They need CPU power to propagate blocks. And so uh, that's obviously a factor. So the original Bitcoin protocol was particularly inefficient with its transmission of blocks. You would operate as a node on the network and receive transactions that, that come in. And then when a block was found on the network, you would receive the block, which included most of these transactions that you already had received. And so this was effectively a doubling of the amount of data that needed to be sent. Uh, but in fact, not an actual doubling of the overall node's bandwidth usage, because it turns out nodes do things other than uh, just relay blocks. And these other things are even less efficient than uh, the block propagation. In particular, this IND process that Bitcoin uses to relay transactions is quite inefficient. So standard Bitcoin protocol method of relaying a transaction is I announce to my peers, hey, I know transaction ID, dead beef. And then the peers respond to me with, would you please send me transaction ID, dead beef? Well, an inf message is on the order of 38 bytes on the wire, something like that. And a transaction is on the order of maybe 200 bytes on the wire. So if I send you, a, I've got a transaction, I'm using 10% of the bandwidth to, of, the, of the transaction just to announce it to you. I send that to all of my peers. Uh, so as a result, uh, even if you got rid of block relay entirely, the, the reduction in bandwidth to a Bitcoin node would be only 12%. But 12% is not nothing. Right? Bitcoin is a highly optimized system and protocol, and we grab for every improvement that we can. Uh, the other thing that is a problem with the resource usage is that this, the old original block propagation mode is very bursty. So you would be using a steady average amount of bandwidth, this transaction sort of randomly came in, but then a block shows up and you've got, boom, a megabyte of data to, to send all at once. And uh, back when I worked at Mozilla, I could actually tell which of my colleagues on our video chat were Bitcoin users because their video would stall out in time with blocks appearing on the Bitcoin network. And would say, turn off the Bitcoin node. Uh, so uh, that, was, that, that peaky behavior was actually a real usability factor in, uh, in how comfortable it was to run a, a node on a particularly residential broadband. If you recall a couple of years back, there was a bunch of noise on the internet about the buffer bloat problem with uh, routers having excessive latency. It's mostly not been fixed still. And big blocks all set it, sent at once is um, basically the perfect storm for buffer blow. So it makes your VoIP mess up. Right? But the bigger concern related to block propagation is this issue about what is the latency to distribute a block all around the network. And particularly, what is the latency to get a block to all of the hash power? And this is a concern for two major reasons. One is that if it takes a long time relative to the interval between blocks to propagate a block, then the network will see more short length forks, meaning that the confirmation is, is less confirmed. Right? There's a possibility that a transaction looks confirmed, but then you find out later it's reworked out. This creates an impact on how fast the minimum interblock interval could be in the, in the network. So Bitcoin has an interblock interval programmed into the system at 10 minutes, and it's a nice, safe number that's far away from running into any convergence failures. But what if in the future, uh, the users of Bitcoin wanted to lower that interblock interval? Well, in order to do that, the block propagation has to be up to it. So that's one reason that it's important. The other one is, is that block propagation time creates progress. So ideally, mining is supposed to work like a perfectly fair lottery. If you have 10% of the network's hash rate, you will mine 10% of the blocks. And um, when we introduce delays into propagating blocks, that breaks down. And mining works more like a race. In a race, the fastest runner will always win, unless you know, the next fastest is very close to them in speed. 
But if you have a runner that is 30% speed and a runner that's 10% speed, the 10% speed runner is never going to beat the 30% speed runner ever in a race. So mining is supposed to be like lottery propagation time makes it more like a race. And the reason for this is that if I don't know about the latest blocks, then my blocks will not extend them. They won't be based on them. And so I'm starting behind. Also, if other miners don't know about my blocks, then they won't extend them. And they'll go mine a, a separate fork of the network. Here are some features. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so there are. I'll talk about that, actually. OK. So why is progress in mining bad? Um, so as I was saying, that the system's designed its incentives are such that every participant should find a proportion equal to their hash rate. Um, and what this really comes down to is uh, centralization pressure. Because if blocks take a long time to propagate, the more centralized miner, the more bigger the consolidation of hash rate, the greater the advantage they have. And there's no obvious internal system limit to this, meaning that you'll make more money because you're more centralized, so then you can buy more hash power, so you can be even bigger, and then you become more centralized. And miners have the opportunity to choose. They can choose to centralized. They can choose to collaborate into a single pool. And they will do that. I'll talk more about that in a minute. In the half. Um, this is often misunderstood. I've seen many times that propagation comes up in Reddit. There's some like, vaguely nationalist, like, screw those Chinese with their slow connections uh, things that people say. Uh, this is wrong thinking because this block propagation issue isn't better or worse for people with faster or slow connections. It's better for people with more hash rate. So if, if it were the case that people in China had very limited bandwidth, then uh, they would gain from this so long as they also have a lot of hash power, which in fact they do. Uh, one of the real tricky things about this is that I feel that in general, we, this is a problem that we need to overkill. And when we talk about how we expend our resources in the community to solving a problem, we can say, okay, look, a half, half solution to something would be good enough. That's true for a lot of things. And other things you need to solve well. But then there's a final set of things which you really need to overkill. You need to, like, it's good and dead, and now we've nuked it from orbit. And the reason I think that, that block propagation is something that we need to overkill is because we can't directly observe the effects of it. If block propagation is too slow and it's causing mining centralization, we won't necessarily see it. So you might ask, why won't miners solve this? This is obviously a problem that adversely affects uh, miners. Well, one reason is that that propagation is actually good for large miners. And I don't think that any large miner today or in the recent past has been exploiting this fact intentionally. But there's this effect that occurs where if you're doing something wrong, but it's profitable for you, you might not notice that you're doing it wrong, right? You're not going to go, why am I making too much money? Ah, I mean, it takes a kind of weird person to do that. I'm one of those weird people. But for the most part, sensible people aren't weird like that. And uh, so that, that's an effect that's uh, worth keeping in mind. And in, also, a minor specialty isn't protocol design, right? So if you ask a miner to solve this problem, they're going to solve it in minor ways, right? Their miner's tool is, gigawatts of power, uh, hardware, contracts, right? There, there are tools in the miner tool belt, but they're not the ones of protocol design. And so we've seen how miners have adapted to long propagation times in the past. So one thing we saw miners do is they centralized fewer pools. They were on a pool that had a high orphan rate. Hmm, I'll move to another pool that's bigger and has a lower orphan rate. This is absolutely something that we've seen happen in the past. And I'll talk a bit about what we did to help uh, stop those problems. Another thing that miners have been doing is uh, extending chains completely blinded, so blindly. So instead of waiting for the block to be propagated, they, they learn enough from another pool to blindly extend the block without validating it, just get the header. <coughs> and, and then they can start mining sooner. And that, this is something that the BIP66 software activation showed us that likely a, a majority of the network hash rate was mining without verifying. And mining without verifying, uh, like many things without verifying, is benign so long as nothing's going wrong. But unfortunately, SPV clients make a very strong security assumption that uh, the miners are validating and are economically incentivized to validate, and so they will validate. Unfortunately, the economics don't work out quite like that. 
the miners go, people produce invalid blocks very rarely. I don't really need to validate all that much because oh, I might lose a block here or there, but it's worth it. This doesn't look so good if you're using an SPV client making you know, maybe multi-million dollar transactions that are unsecured because of it. They're not vaccinated their blocks. Mm -hmm. So I don't bring this up to cast blame, right? Bitcoin is designed to have a system of incentives and we want and expect all the participants to follow their incentives. And I don't think miners are, there's not a moral judgment here, right? If miners are mining without validating, if miners are centralizing, well, they're doing it because they're incentivized to do so. So we need to make it so that breaking the system isn't the most profitable move. And improving block uh, propagation is one of the things that helps us do that. So when thinking about why does it take a while for a block to propagate, there are many sources of latency in the whole sequence of critical steps to relay a block through the network. There's the step of just creating a candidate block to hand out. And this is something that we were able to change, to improve in the Bitcoin core software through better software engineering rather than protocol changes. So back before 012, you could easily take two to four seconds to generate a block template uh, for a full block. Uh, today, that's something more like 30 milliseconds. And that's just through clever software optimization. Then uh, when a miner's created the block, they dispatch it out to the mining hardware, out to their customers if they're a pool, they hear a solution back. Those things, there's latency in them, actually quite a bit, um, seconds in some cases, but they're not in my remit to control. This is something that mining hardware manufacturers could work on. And if you were purchasing mining hardware for someone, you should be asking your manufacturer about what the latency of the hardware is. Most of these things can be fixed via firmware improvements. But it does make an impact on miner revenue. Then uh, once the solution has come back to the miner, you need to distribute that solution to the first peers outside of your network. And so this takes time to send the data across the wire. You have to you know, shove the bytes out on the wire. There are protocol round trips, this inv and get data step, and there's TCP round trips. And because the TCP round trips are invisible, people don't realize how slow it is. Actually, over the wide scale internet, before we had the new technology that I'm talking about tonight, we measured the effective block propagation speed in the Bitcoin network by looking at how likely blocks were to be orphaned based on their size, and found that the aggregate transmission rate for blocks through the Bitcoin network was only around 750 kilobits a second. Um, and the reason for this is because of latencies in the nodes and also uh, just the fact that packet losses, TCP behavior, all these things together made it though, even though Bitcoin nodes have fast connections, propagation between miners in that study in particular was only 750k uh, a second. So um, you know, one of the things that's very important to keep in mind is that if we're talking about sending data all around the world, we're going to have hops that are high latency, like a link from here to China has got well over 100 milliseconds of round trip time. And so if your protocol requires a, an ask and answer process, then that's guaranteeing that it's not going to be particularly fast. And then from then on, the block cascades from peer to peer to peer. Um, one step in here that I mentioned is that obviously in the original Bitcoin protocol, every time you uh, relay a block, you would first validate it. And, uh, there have been a number of speed ups in 14 and 15 to improve the validation speed at the tip through better caching and things like that. But these more advanced block propagation techniques can actually relay blocks without fully validating them. And I'll explain why that's okay. <laughs> so this is just a visualization of the original uh, Bitcoin uh, block relay protocol. So you have two nodes, node A and node B. Time goes down. So a block comes in, there's a chunk of validation, the node sends across an inf message, hey, I've got this block. The other side responds with a, hey, give me that block. It responds with, here is a megabyte of data. And that's the original block rate protocol. So this is really simple. Uh, and it, it has some efficiency in that you don't send this one megabyte block to a node multiple times. But it's also pretty inefficient. Um, in practice on the network today, this is uh, a number measured from my node this morning from the last two weeks. Is that, a node knows 99.953% of all the transactions in a block before the block arrives. Um, and as I mentioned before, there, in addition to the fact that there's a round trip in this inv get data block sequence, 
the underlying TCP protocol is adding additional round trips in many cases. And of course, you've got to wait for validation. So one of the earliest things that um, people worked on to try to improve this was that Peter and Matt observed that BIP37 filter block messages could be used to uh, transmit a block but eliminate transactions that had already been sent. So I could ask you for a block and you would send me the block but skip the transactions that you had already sent me. Um, but back in 2013 when this was first done, uh, testing seemed to suggest that it actually slowed down the transmission due to various overheads, also due to the fact that blocks were much smaller then, so it was a very different network than today. Um, and there were protocol problems. The filtering would assume that you remembered every transaction you had previously been sent. So if you received a transaction and then discarded it, then a block came in that included that transaction, you wouldn't have it, and you'd have no way to get it. Uh, no reliable way to get it. But that was the start of an idea, and it got implemented, and we tried it out. And that, that inspired a lot of work refining the ideas. Um, also, around that time, uh, we started seeing very high orphaning rates in the network that were contributing to pool consolidation. And at least among some developers like Matt and myself, there was a bit of a panic with like, oh crap, is the Bitcoin network going to catch fire and die? Of course, you know, this doesn't usually get publicized. <laughs> uh, uh, and when we saw things like ghash.io creeping up to majority of the network hash rate on a single level. And so this, uh, High orphaning rates was a clear causative factor, and so we started working on things to, to fix it. So one of the first things Matt did to fix it is he started this block relay network. And so Matt's idea starting out there was that he would start up a bunch of really fast, well-maintained Bitcoin nodes, connect them together well, and encourage miners to connect to them. With a theory that part of the reason that relay was slow in the network is that just the average speed of nodes in the network was poor, and miners, because of commercial reasons, uh, were sometimes hesitant to connect directly with each other because if you know your competitor's IP address, you can DOS attack. So he set this thing up and it, and it worked and it seemed to help, uh, but Matt was aware that just having faster nodes wouldn't solve the problem. And so he developed a, uh, a set of custom protocols to be used with this network and evolve them over time. So this has resulted in a little bit of confusion because sometimes when we talk about the relay network, we're really talking about the protocols the relay network used. And sometimes we're talking about the relay network it became things like compact blocks and fiber that I'm going to talk about today. Like it, the, basically, Matt's privately operated network that was publicly accessible became a test bed to try new block propagation techniques in public. So I just want to make clear that the relay network is not relay network protocols. And I'm not going to say anything more about the relay network itself, but I am going to talk about relay network protocols. So the first actually widespread production used uh, faster block relay protocol was something that I call the fast block relay protocol. It, it really doesn't have a name because it was the relay network protocol uh, initially. And the idea behind the fast block relay protocol is basically uh, if you have some hub node, Alice, Alice streams every transaction she sees to you, Bob. And then when a block shows up, uh, Bob has promised by protocol contract to remember all of the last 10,000 transactions Alice has streamed. And then uh, a block shows up, and um, then Alice can just send short two-byte IDs to say, I want you to use the nth and the n minus nth and the n minus nth transaction. And so now sending a block, you don't have to send a megabyte of data, you send, uh, you just send only two bytes per transaction. Now, if there's a transaction in the block that Alice never sent, Alice can just send a zero and then send the transaction explicitly. And one of the great things about this is that also by protocol contract, Alice doesn't have to ask for permission to send this data. It's relatively small, so even if you didn't need the block, it doesn't hurt you to get it. And Alice will just stream it out to you, no asking. And so this protocol didn't require a round trip. So it would be, you know, the block would be transferred in half the round trip time. And it would always be transferred in half the round trip time. But the downside of this is that Alice was having to send you every transaction on the network redundantly. And also sending you blocks potentially redundantly. And so this protocol had quite high overhead if you had many Alice's. So it worked when talking to Matt's network or just a couple of them. And there were some miners that ran their own 
uh, copies of this stuff as well, but it has high overhead. So it's best used with a very hub and spoke topology. So building out of some of these things, I created this like omnibus high-level protocol design where I took every good idea I could find or come up with for block propagation and created this page called Block Network Coding. I dare you to read it. Uh, it's, it's, it's really kind of notes, right? It's, it's inscrutable. But basically, I came up with a bunch of cool ideas that I could argue got uh, communication optimal block propagation. Like, you can't make it more efficient than this. But the problem with this approach was when we started to try to implement some of these ideas is that uh, they turned out to be very CPU inefficient. And it doesn't really matter how small you made the block if you're going to spend four CPU seconds to decode the thing once it shows up. Uh, so there are many ideas all sort of mixed together and combined in this page. And almost all of them have now come out and been included in production systems. But uh, that required a lot of engineering to try to make them fast and to find the ones that actually you know, paid for their cost in both implementation and CPU. So the, the next big advance in block propagation is BIP-152 compact blocks. So the primary goal of BIP-152 was to eliminate um, the overhead from block relay. So basically get rid of that double transaction transmission. And uh, for a lot of the developers, we, we basically prioritize doing BIP-152 to try to negate some of the negative potential effects of the SegWit capacity increases by making it more efficient to transmit blocks in advance. So, as I said, compact blocks is really designed to lower bandwidth usage. It's not really intended to lower latency, but it, it does that too as a side effect. Um, so there's a, there's a design draft document that's linked to in the slides and to the text, uh, which is totally useful to everyone in the audience here right now. Uh, maybe actually useful when this stuff's posted. Um, so in December 2015, I wrote a very long, high-level design document. Um, Matt made it better and uh, turned it into BIP-152 in April. Today, compact blocks is used on greater than 97% of all nodes on the network, and it's what carries blocks in the BIP-1 network today. So compact blocks has two modes, uh, non-high bandwidth and high bandwidth. So what, what's a compact block? So the idea behind a compact block is we want to exploit the far end, the remote party, uh, no stuff, but we don't know what they know. So what a compact block does is it sends a block header transaction count, uh, a nonce that I'll talk about in a minute, and then it sends a long sequence of short IDs. Uh, there are six bytes each, and it sends one for every transaction in the block. And a short ID is a hash of the transaction ID and the salt, effectively. So um, it also can send explicit transactions. So like, for example, the Coinbase transaction in the block, the far end never knows that. So you, you know it doesn't have it. So you can just send it explicitly. And when you receive one of these compact blocks, you can scan your memory pool and other sources of transactions you might have laying around and see if you get any matches. Uh, this uses SIP hash as the main hash function in it because it's very, very fast. And it needs to be fast because you need to scan through all of your mempool with the salt and uh, look for those matches. So this scheme needs to send only six bytes per transaction in the block, which is less efficient than the older fast block relay protocol, but it doesn't have any requirement for a hub and spoke topology. Um, and so it's a bit less efficient, but three times less efficient in fact. Uh, than that, but it's still way more efficient than sending full transactions. But as a result, there's some complexity because these short 48-bit IDs at least could theoretically have collisions, and you still have to have the protocol figure out like when something's missing, you need to fill it in. So I mentioned that these short IDs are salted, and the reason that it's salted is pretty straightforward. So even if we were to imagine that our short IDs were eight bytes long, so even less efficient, it would be very easy for a troublemaker to produce two transactions that had the same short ID if it weren't for the salt. You could just uh, use an efficient collision finder to find two transactions with the same short ID. And then you could spam the network with these things and jam up block propagation. And the miner could do this, in fact, to create a profit potentially. So in the, the compact block scheme, this short ID is salted using the block header of the block that found it which obviously an attacker is not going to know when they announce their transactions to the network. This block hasn't been found yet. It also has a, an additional salt that's provided by each of the 
generating parties that generate a compact block. And the idea of this additional salt is that if just by dumb luck, some transaction to pair in a block or a transaction in the mempool plus a transaction in the block were to happen to have the short ID, the same short ID when hashed in the block header is the key, the, uh, by having different salts on different links means that these collisions would happen sort of randomly on the network instead of happening everywhere. And as a result, blocks will propagate around slowdown. So if Alice and Bob's connection gets slowed down because of a collision, that's okay, the block will just route around them, go through the fastest path through the network. It starts off with the receiving peer requesting high bandwidth mode. It's not a default thing. You have to say to the remote side, use high bandwidth mode. Then at some arbitrary time in the future later, a block shows up. And then what happens is a compact block is immediately sent. You don't validate the block first. So this little validation gray box is moved down. And it occurs at the same time you're sending out the block to peers. And the reason that this is okay is because uh, by definition of the protocol, it works this way. And high bandwidth mode should only be used by full nodes who are going to validate the blocks themselves. So you'll notice if it's bad and you won't hand it out to any SPD clients or cause problems for them. And then most of the time, that's it. The block is transmitted. The protocol can stop there. The further lines are dotted because most of the time, some 85% of the time, that's where the protocol stops. The block shows up, the high bandwidth compact block peer sends it to you, you're done. And that's the case when you happen to know all the transactions. Now, if you didn't know all of the transactions in it or there was a hash collision, you have to disambiguate. Like, show me the transaction that's in position X or position Y. And so the receiver will send a git block TXN message, which says, tell me the transactions in position 1, 8, 7, 14, whatever's missing. And then the remote side responds with, here are your transactions. The low bandwidth mode of compact blocks works similarly, except the validation is not deserialized with it, so you have to validate before participating. And just like the original block, transmission, you send it in, you say, I'd like to send you a block, would you like it? And then you respond, yes, please send me the compact block. So this adds an extra round trip time, uh, but it uses less bandwidth. So one consequence of this high bandwidth mode is that if you've asked multiple peers to give you high bandwidth service, it means you may get multiple copies. But getting multiple copies of a compact block isn't a big deal. The average size of a compact block in the Bitcoin network today is a little over 13 kilobytes. So getting four copies isn't, isn't a big problem. So as I said, can waste high bandwidth can waste a little bandwidth, but it makes it much faster. So per the spec, um, Bitcoin Core requests the three last peers that had relayed you a block to use high bandwidth mode. And if a different peer relays you a block first, then you'll ask it and drop one of the other ones. Um, and we found that the vast, vast majority of the times uh, the, the first block to re the first peer to relay to you a block is one of the last three uh, to relay to you a block, just in terms of the network topology. Uh, this redundancy also has other positive effects. So you can denial a service attack a node in the original Bitcoin protocol by saying, "Hey, I got a block," and they say, "Great, send me the block," and then you just don't respond. <laughs> and they will time out eventually. But to, uh, with the problem with the timeouts is that they have to be rather high, otherwise a temporary slowdown of your bandwidth will cause you to disconnect the peer erroneously. So the timeouts are long. And this redundancy in transmission means that you bypass any of these uh, delays and timeouts. So summarizing compact blocks, these two modes, uh, the high bandwidth mode takes uh, half round trip time, just you know, send in one direction, up to one if there were missing transactions. And the non-high bandwidth mode takes one and a half round trip times to two and a half round trip times. But in all these cases, whether or not you're in high bandwidth or uh, non-high bandwidth, whether or not you took one round trip time or two and a half round trip times, in all cases, compact block saves over 99% of the bandwidth sent sending blocks. Which sounds really impressive, except you have to keep in mind that that is 99% of 12%. So it doesn't make that big a difference. Uh, but it does make a difference, not a difference. And that's what Compact Blocks was designed to do. So I'm of the opinion that further protocols can't really meaningfully improve the bandwidth usage overall, because even if you have the size of the Compact Blocks, uh, you're still only having something that's 1% of 12%, right? 
Um, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. But latency can be improved. So the compact blocks, in the worst case, can take two and a half protocol round trip times. Uh, and more with, once you consider TCP. And for a long haul link around the world, that's, that's really long. And the fast block relay protocol showed us you can do better because it was always, in every case, one half uh, uh, round trip time for the protocol. So there is another thing called XThin that was done by the Bitcoin Limited folks, and I'll comment on it briefly because people otherwise ask me about it. Um, so it was a parallel development where basically uh, Matt and Peter did this bloom filter block stuff in 2013. Mike Hearn re-earthed it and threw, made a patch for Bitcoin XT, which didn't work particularly well in uh, the end of 2015. The BU people picked it up and started working on it in January, and apparently they were unaware of all the other development we've been doing on this stuff. Um, developers don't always communicate well. Um, it's a very similar protocol to uh, the uh, to compact blocks. Um, some BU advocates have irritated me pretty extensively by claiming that compact blocks was copied from it. Who cares? And no, it wasn't. They were just parallel developed. Um, it has some major differences. Uh, one is that it uses eight bytes, so 64-bit short IDs, which it doesn't salt it, meaning that it has this vulnerability where you can very easily um, construct a collision. And uh, it turns out that a bunch of the BU advocates, and including their developers, didn't know uh, about the birthday paradox effect on how easy it is to compute collisions. And they argued that it wasn't feasible to construct a 64-bit collision. And I had a bunch of fun on Reddit for two days responding to every post with collisions generated bespoke from the messages, because they said it would take hours to generate them. I could generate them in about in three seconds or something. <laughs> um, so uh, the other thing that it does differently from compact blocks is that uh, it cannot be used in this high bandwidth kind of mode where you send an unsolicited block. With XThin, there's always an inv message, and then the response to the inv message sends a bloom filter of the receiving node's mempool. It basically says, here's an approximate list of the transactions I know about. And as a result of that bloom filter, which I think is on the order of 20 kilobytes typically, um, the, most of the time, there's no need to get extra transactions because the sender will know what transactions you're missing and it will send them. So basically, I look at the, this optimization is that it costs a constant one round trip time because you can't use high bandwidth mode, plus bandwidth, plus CPU, plus attack surface, to save a round trip time less than 15% of the time because, um, high, because high bandwidth mode normally doesn't have a round trip, 85% of the time. I don't think that idea is useless, and I think it would be useful for the non-high bandwidth mode case, but it's a lot more code in attack surface for a relatively little improvement. Uh, this is particularly interesting for XThin uh, because, because of political drama. It was really rushed into production because they wanted to claim to have it first, and it resulted in at least three exploitable crash bugs that knocked out every Bitcoin Unlimited node on the network and every Bitcoin Classic node on the network. And when they fixed some of those bugs, they introduced later uh, bugs that could cause nodes to get split. Particularly, interestingly, they introduced a bug that if you created a short ID collision, the node would get stuck, um, which is a kind of neat combination of two vulnerabilities, so a lesson to learn from that. The BU folks also have this thing called Expediated, uh, which was basically a response to BIP 152 uh, because their forwarding without high bandwidth mode is much slower. And it's a manually configured mode that works almost identical to BIP-152 high bandwidth mode. It doesn't send a bloom filter, it sends without asking. But since it's manual configuration, I don't think anyone really ever used it. And I'm confident it's not used today because their software doesn't support SegWit and only miners would use this. And miners need to have software that supports SegWit. So, um, it doesn't have a spec either, so I think it uses the same vulnerable short ID scheme, but I'm not actually sure. I don't feel like reading the code. Um, but it's a thing, so now you know. Um, so I mentioned above that I don't think you can do much better on bandwidth, but you can certainly do better on latency. And we care a lot about the worst case. Uh, if miners can gain from not cooperating, from filling a block full of novel transactions that we've never seen before, then we should expect that sooner or later someone's going to do it. Um, and in the worst case, 
BIP-152 behavior is just like <coughs> the original behavior. It'll send a megabyte of data, ultimately, but with one more round trip time. So in the worst case, it's potentially worse. And uh, on fast, low latency links, BIP-152 is extra round trip is irrelevant. So you can say that uh, BIP-152 is all you need on a fast, low latency link. But this two and a half round trip kit time, in the worst case, is really awful internationally, especially because long haul international links typically have on the order of 1% packet loss. And that'll make TCP stall and have uh, round trips. So I want to take a quick decor into some CompSci fundamentals. And um, I think most people are at least vaguely familiar with the concept of an erasure code. This is what RAID does with your uh, disks. Basically, you can take n blocks of data and code them into n plus k blocks of data, such that any n out of the n plus k is sufficient to recover the whole thing. So this is what RAID, RAID 6 does, for example. You've got two extra drives, and so long as you have no more than two failed, you can recover all your data. It seems a little magical, but um, if you think about the k is one case, you can just use XOR and you can work out on paper how that just works fine. You compute your redundant block as the XOR of all the other blocks. Um, this can be done for any N and K. So you can, for example, split a Bitcoin block into a thousand pieces uh, such that you need only 500 of them, any 500 to recover them. Um, but the software to do that uh, is not particularly computationally efficient. So if you use a Reed Solomon code, which is the canonical, optimally space efficient tool for this, it's very slow if N and K are large. Uh, but there are other techniques that we can use that are not perfectly efficient. They sometimes require an extra block or two extra blocks, um, but or which are very fast. So this is an erasure code, so keep this construct in mind. Um, then another, con another concept that there's a various highly academic working groups in the ITF would like to talk about is this idea called network coding, which is an application of linear codes and erasure codes to multicast and broadcast. And the idea is that if you want to send out a piece of data to a bunch of different nodes, you can split it into different parts and use uh, error coding on it and spread them out over the network so that you never send the same piece of data twice. You make sort of optimal use of your communication links. And then all of the peers in the network collaborate to recombine data. And as soon as they have enough of it, they're done. So you can think of it th this like BitTorrent swarming, but it can be more communication efficient because you don't need to locate a correct source. Everyone's a correct source. Um, and for actual usage in BitTorrent, efficiency, computational efficiency is more important. But for our block relay, we really don't want to have a lot of back and forth two-way communication. So we need, to not need to, we need to not know where sources are. So this brings us to Bitcoin Fiber, which is a protocol uh, developed heavily derived out of this uh, block network coding right up I did early on. And the idea of Fiber is this. You basically start with BIP-152 compact block high bandwidth mode, but you modify the short IDs to include the transaction limits. Then you transmit uh, over UDP instead of over TCP, and you apply erasure coding to the blocks. You take the megabyte block or whatever, and you expand it into eight megabytes of redundant data, and you don't send the original block data. You only send the redundant data, and you stream it out to different peers, and then all of those peers stream it out to each other. So I send you a chunk, and you a chunk, and you a chunk, and you a chunk, and you all send each other your chunks, and all the chunks are useful because there's no redundancy sent over it. And then when the receiver gets this data, they use this size augmented short IDs in their compact blocks to lay out the block in memory, and there'll be holes in the block where transactions are missing that they didn't know about them. And then they use the erasure code to fill in the holes to make a complete block. And so, effectively what this does is allows you to communicate a block to a remote end where you have no idea how much they know, but if they know something, they can make good use of it. And so you can send it out, and you don't need to receive a response, and they are guaranteed to get the block, so long as they receive at least as many packets as they were missing. Um, and, uh, and you never need to hear back from them, so you never take this round-trip delay. You just have a one-way delay. So effectively, Fiber lets you build this uh, single globally distributed node with a very, very fast relay of blocks internally. And what this actually achieves in practice is on Matt's relay network that uses this, is 95th percentile latency is under 16 milliseconds over the speed of light delay. 
the speed of light delay is how long does it take to get you know, one byte from one end of the world to the other. And 95% of the time, the system achieves transmitting the entire block in under 16 milliseconds above that, which is pretty good. It could be better. Yes, oceans are big. Um, so this scheme has a lot of advantages, right? It's unconditional unidirectional transport. You never need a round trip, unless a node is just offline. You know, didn't get any of the packets. Um, but it needs to be used only within a single administrative domain, because part of the way that it works and it's so fast is that these nodes relay packets between each other without being able to validate them, because they can't reconstruct the block yet. They're just relaying it as soon as it comes in. So this would be a DOS vector if it was open to the public. This also has absurd bandwidth overheads. Uh, I think in the production fiber network, it sends eight times the total amount of the block. But unlike the overheads in the original uh, Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network, these overheads don't make the block slower to reconstruct. You don't have to receive all eight copies. You just re need to receive one copy, and most of that copy came out of your memory. So the way that Matt uses uh, this protocol in his own network is that he has a bunch of nodes, they're on well-maintained systems, and they speak fiber amongst each other, and then he speaks regular BIP-152 high bandwidth node to peers, anyone who wants to connect to him. Because these BIP-152 links are short, because they're all people connecting to the closest fiber node, uh, the fact that it has lots of round trips doesn't matter. So of course, there's always the drive to do better. As I said, we want to overkill this, right? So there are lots of tools in the tool belt that we could potentially use to make some of this stuff better. So one of the tools is set reconciliation. So this is an idea very similar to, based on some of the same technology as uh, the erasure coding stuff. And the idea is that I have a set, like a list of transactions, and you have a set, a list of transactions. And we don't know what each other's sets are, but we assume that they're really similar. There's some differences, but they're similar. And so it turns out that there are protocols that allow someone to send a single message to another party who has a similar set. They don't know how it's similar. And the message has size that's equal to the symmetric set difference. So the size is the number of entries I send is you know, how many things I have that you don't and how many things that you have that I don't. And there are protocols that allow you to, with no more data than that, um, recover the other set. So I can send you a message and now you know my set. Um, there are algorithms to do this which are communications optimal, meaning that there is no way to do it even more efficiently in terms of communication than that. Uh, they're based on interpolating roots uh, in uh, polynomial ratios. They're very similar to RS codes, but much more expensive to decode. So basically they take CPU time that's cubic in the set difference and all of these operations are expensive. There are also some newer techniques, uh, IBLT being an example, which are fast. They're linear in time in the set difference, but they have bad constant factors in communication, so they send more data. And if your set differences are small and the set entries are small, for IBLT it can be like five times the set difference that you have to have to get a, a, a very reliable decode. So how could you use this set reconciliation technology? So back in this early efficient block transfer design doc that I wrote, I described you can use this to just send the short IDs in a compact block and use much less bandwidth. Um, but the big challenge in, in using that is that you still have to communicate the transaction order because that's normative in a block and um, miners can make whatever order they want subject to the dependency graph. And also suggest this idea, though apparently they were unaware that I previously suggested it. They, they went and implemented it uh, using uh, IBLT, and my slide is messed up. Their, their particular proposal assumes basically that you've changed the Bitcoin consensus to require transactions all be in a particular order, and that avoids this having to communicate the permutation. Um, a challenge with that, though, is that right now in Bitcoin today, miners will typically order transactions by how profitable they are to the miner, which is a kind of unknown function to the receiver. And uh, this ordering it from most income to least income means that mining pool software can trim blocks to fit in the Coinbase transactions by dropping the last couple transactions. And that would be broken if you have a required order. Um, using set reconciliation this way ignores the latency uh, in, in general. 
Um, in particular, graphing just only talks about bandwidth, never talks about latency. If, since it's ignoring the um, since it's ignoring latency, it probably would have been better using polynomial set reconciliation rather than IBLT. Um, but in any case, so on one hand, I'm really excited about set rec reconciliation. It's like cool rocket science, and the IBLT algorithm in particular is like a great programming project. It's just complicated enough to be hard. Basically, any programmer can implement it, and it's magic. So if you're looking for something fun to implement, I, I would recommend actually implementing the IBLD decoder. It's, it's quite fun. Um, but, but this technology doesn't really seem like it would lower latencies in any normal application of block propagation. And bandwidth's already basically solved. Any further improvements is shaving off fractions of a fractions of a 1% or something like that. So the Graphene Press talked about 10% less bandwidth, but it, or 10x less bandwidth, but it means 10x less bandwidth than a compact block, which means that you're going to save all of aggregate of a couple hundred kilobytes a day on a node. So not that exciting. Um, and then using these techniques isn't free, take software. Uh, if, the, if the set reconciliation fails, you get an extra round trip time. There's no way to incrementally increase the size of an IBLT. So there, there's negatives there too as well. So in my opinion, bandwidth for relaying blocks is 99% solved. And so using set reconciliation to try to improve that is probably optimizing for the wrong thing. But it's fun science. Now, I did just say 99% solved. So that means we can do something better. So I think there are interesting areas for improvement. So there are applications where further bandwidth improvements would still improve latency. So Compact Blocks gets our block relay down using 20 kilobytes of bandwidth. That doesn't take long to send over any normal thing. So you wouldn't think that reducing bandwidth further would improve latency, but there are cases where it will. There's also some interesting interactions with future consensus techniques, which we'll talk about. And there are some things that we can do which aren't necessarily useful for block propagation remove, that improve our bandwidth overall. So when is 20 kilobytes actually going to affect latency? When is that too big? So one important to me use case is the Blockstream satellite. So Blockstream right now is broadcasting globally, or at least Europe and the Americas at the moment, the Bitcoin blockchain, soon to cover Asia. And so the whole idea of this scheme, this system is to improve the partitioning resistance of Bitcoin and lower the bandwidth cost for running nodes because you can receive blocks over the satellite and then use your internet connection only sparingly to validate headers and to, and to send out transactions. So on Blockstream satellite today, the link speed is uh, very slow, 80 kilobits a second, which is well more than enough to stay in sync with the Bitcoin network. Um, and we use software-defined radio so we can actually increase or decrease the bandwidth uh, with some trade-offs in coverage area. So Blockstream Satellite uses Bitcoin Fiber for robust one-way communication. It's perfectly adapted for it. Uh, but this 20 kilobyte compact block means that it takes a minimum of two seconds to send a block across it, which isn't particularly attractive for mining. You could mine over it, but it's not particularly good. So we'd like to reduce that. Another uh, area that could improve some of this block propagation stuff is transaction compression. So the early fast block relay protocol tried applying standard LZMA compression, but that turned out to be basically worthless. Standard compressors don't do too much when you use them on small amounts of data. And the faster compressors uh, do even less, and they're slow too. So uh, if you, you can get good compression if you compress one block or multiple blocks at a time, but if you do that, that's not useful for transaction relay, where you turn single transactions at a time. So it turns out that it's possible to construct an alternative serialization for Bitcoin transactions, where you replace the fields in a normal transaction with different ones. And you can convert between a normal transaction and alternative serialization back and forth, so losslessly. Which means that you can take this alternative serialization and use it on the whole of Bitcoin history. And uh, Peter and I came up with one that results in reducing the size of the whole Bitcoin history by 28%. Um, only while working on a single transaction at a time, never exploiting multiple transaction correlations. Uh, downside of this is that it's more CPU intensive, but we haven't done enough of the implementation to know exactly how CPU intensive it would be. And uh, I'd, I'd love it if Peter would have time to work on this again, but there are too many things that only Peter is working on. So.
Um, but this, if, if this were used, it could make block storage smaller, it could make transaction relay smaller, and it would make block propagation smaller as well. But the real effect for users would be probably on the transaction relay being smaller. Um, another idea that I think is really potentially powerful is to use set reconciliation for transaction relay. Now, I don't think it's all that useful for block relay, but transactions are naturally a set. And uh, back in February 2016, I talked about uh, an idea on Bitcoin Talk where basically, instead of a node offering its transactions to all of its peers, whenever you receive a transaction, you would offer it to one other peer, and you would flip a coin, and half of the time you'd offer it to another peer. So you'd send to one and a half peers per hop. Now, if you just do this alone, what you'd find is most transactions wouldn't make it very far in the network because they'd go around in the network until they made a cycle and then they'd stop. And they wouldn't flood through the whole network. But if you then have nodes periodically running set reconciliation to compare where their mempools with each other, then any time a node got stuck in a cycle, it would break out of the cycle by the set reconciliation running. And the set reconciliation would be very low bandwidth. So this would make transaction relay much more efficient in the Bitcoin network. Another thing that I've been working on and have an implementation almost done for is this idea that I call template delta compression. Um, so the big cost in set re reconciliation for ordinary box is sending the order of transactions, sending the permutation. So what if you sent a block template in advance of someone, so there isn't the block yet, but I can guess what the block will be, and I send the template over to you, and then later when a block shows up, I send you not a permutation, but a permutation difference. And if I have an efficient way of encoding the difference between the block I was expecting and the order in the block that actually showed up, then maybe this doesn't take much data. So if you think back to this fast block relay protocol, it was very efficient, but it required a lot of state. You had to remember all the transactions that the remote side sent. But with uh, BIP-152, we eliminated all that state and made a stateless protocol, so it was easy to have many peers. But what if you introduce a little state back in and say that for one or two or three peers, I'll remember a block template that they sent me, and then I can support differences with that. So I designed an efficient and fast compressor for typical subset permutations between block templates and blocks using the AV1 video codex range coder, which I worked on in my previous life. Um, <laughs> thank you. And uh, what I found using the scheme that I've come up with so far is that if you look at the difference between a 30 second old template and the block that actually showed up on the network, I got a median size of 200 or 2,916 bytes, a mean size of 3,041 bytes, and 22% of packets or of blocks fit in one IP packet over the internet. So, as I said, saving bandwidth is not important for many cases, uh, but for the block stream satellite, for example, this would change the block relay time from two seconds down to you know, 200, 300 milliseconds, which would be a big improvement there. And that's already naturally a hub and spoke kind of system. And so it's okay to retain state for it. But the other reason why this Delta stuff I think is particularly interesting and maybe useful, other than for the satellite, is that there's a set of proposals out there that I call pre-consensus. So basically, this whole block propagation problem is an issue because mining is, is kind of a race around announcing a block. And so what if you could have all of the miners somehow get together and decide, in the next block, we're going to include X. And then when the block shows up, it includes X. And so all you have to send to send the block is, hey, that block showed up. It had things I said it would have. And here's my payout address, and here's the notes. The paper is an early example of a pre-consensus technique. But it's not very Bitcoin-y. It works by introducing identities to miners. Uh, and it's not something that you could just slot into Bitcoin without very deep technical and economic changes. But it looks like it's possible to do uh, pre-consensus in a very Bitcoin-compatible way. Um, there are several ideas for it. One of them gets called weak blocks, where you basically have miners mine a peer-to-pool-like share chain that commits to transactions that they're intending to include in the future. And uh, these blocks come much more frequently than ordinary Bitcoin blocks. And then when a block shows up, you just reference the best weak block for it. And this is basically a perfect fit for template deltas. 
because most of the time the difference between the weak block and the actual block is negligible. Right? It should be almost exactly the same. Um, there are many other known improvements possible that uh, people have been thinking about. So this fiber-like swarming block thing that right now in fiber can only be done in a single administrative domain between trusted nodes could be made something that we swarm over the entire Bitcoin network by making blocks commit to the chunks that they send out. But doing that would require making the error correcting code consensus normative, right? It would have to be part of the Bitcoin consensus rules. Validating it would take more CPU time for validation. Um, considering how much more development there is to do on this stuff, I don't know how reasonable it would be to do that. And there are some downsides of it as well. In particular, if you want to prove that a particular packet was one of the ones the miner had authorized, the SPD proof for it, the hash tree, would be quite large. Another thing is that consensus could require an order that obeyed dependencies, which would make it uh, compatible to do that, so you could make set reconciliation and deltas more efficient, but it would break truncation for miners. Or we could have a stronger convention. Right now, when, you prior when a miner prioritizes transactions, those transactions end up at the top of their block. Bitcoin node software could resort the block with the transactions the miner selected so that they're in a more predictable order. But it's still unclear which of these things are worth their complexity cost in. So uh, block propagation is a really cool area, lots of neat trade-offs. I think one of the biggest surprises is that there are all these really awesome ideas that it turns out when you implement it, make things worse. I guess I should be used to that because that's how everything works in engineering. Um, we really benefited a lot in, in this work from Matt's um, uh, relay network because we're able to take these ideas, and does it work, does it not, I don't know, deploy it. And uh, it was only his nodes, so if it was bad, we could just change it. And it meant that we weren't rushing out technology into the Bitcoin network that could, say, be used to crash every node in the network. Um, and through this process of iterating, many of the ideas that initially were completely unworkable and too slow turned out to be uh, workable once they were scaled back a little bit, and now you know, we're using them. So, thank you. First, questions for the talk, but after that I can open it up and like usually have some good off-topic discussion here. So you guys should wait for the mic. Do you have a question? Are there any uh, so on your favorite topic of how to make compact blocks even smaller, mm. uh, or something like that, uh, uh, so the thing where you're getting these like two byte indexes of transactions, yep. uh, would it be more efficient to send uh, a compactified bit field, yes, and then the permutation. And also, you talked about getting things down so they fit like within a single packet. Isn't that like two kilobytes for just the permutation, just completely incompressible? Yeah, if the permutation is uniform. However, we have a very strong prior in what the permutation looks like. That's why I'm able to get into that size with my template differencer because it turns out that miners today produce blocks that are in. Um, that are in the Bitcoin core order, which is basically ranked by ancestor fee rate, plus some exceptions where they've prioritized transactions, and those move to the top of the block. And so my encoding scheme is really efficient for, here's some crap that's out of order and the rest is in order. Um, and yeah, this two byte thing, that could be made a lot more efficient. The trade-off is there's a CPU time trade-off, like reading two bytes and indexing is super fast, you could go all the way to using an arithmetic coder and eliminating the transactions you've already selected and, and, and doing things which my template differencer actually does, but that's quite a bit slower. Uh, and as far as uh, reducing uh, bandwidth used by the actual relaying of transactions, mm -hmm. uh, a pretty good uh, architect, a pretty good network topology for doing that is no full nodes become part of some club and each transaction belongs to a club, and you kind of scream it out within the club, 
and then you have a designated peer. Have group. one peer in that club, right? Yeah. So one of the there are many papers on efficient gossip networks. So that's the academic area you want to look at for this stuff. One of the things that academic work on gossip networks uh, doesn't really address is Byzantine fault tolerant gossip networks. So the most efficient gossip network schemes all tend to be one where a single malicious peer can like black hole all your traffic. So one of the nice things about Bitcoin's mechanism is that it's super Byzantine robust. You can have nodes that are uh, completely malicious and it won't really slow the propagation of transactions at all. I think that we want to be somewhere in between in practice, um, but academia so far hasn't been super useful on, on concrete schemes that are in between. I think this scheme that I described with the the low fan out plus reconciliation is Byzantine robust, but I don't have a strong proof of that yet. What's uh, what's the current propagation delay across the network, and what is uh, what do you think is a good target propagation so, delay? So we've lost our ability to measure it because we've made it low enough that the orphan rate has become shot at this point. Um, the, uh, it, it's, it's hard to say. Um, there's, there's some stats that people have from polling random peers in the network, but that's not the actual important data. So Christian Decker has a chart, and it's very nice to see how it's gotten much better. Um, but it's, it's not looking at miners, it's just looking at peers. So the best way we have to measure the propagation times for miners is to look at how, many, how often blocks are getting orphaned. Um, and, and we kind of overshot a little bit at some of this work because basically we were improving things and the orphan rate wasn't going down for a long time. And then a whole bunch of miners upgraded to support SegWit and the orphan rate dropped overnight. In fact, actually we went something like 5,000 blocks without a single orphan, which is very, uh, unlikely, uh, but it, you know, chance happens, right? <laughs> so I, I don't have good concrete numbers on what the propagation times are. I think they're pretty good for the current load on the network. Now the interesting challenge is, is propagation time still adequate once we're producing blocks of more data? In them? If I can comment on that for a little bit, the fact that we are seeing very few orphans on the network can mean two possible things. It could either mean our technology is awesome and we've solved all of, of uh, propagation delay issues, or the, or the network has become very centralized and all miners are working together. And <laughs> it, it's very hard to tell the difference between the two. Yeah, and, and orphaning is a very noisy metric in any case. We normally, like before all of this, before blocks got bloated and before um, all of this awesome optimization, there were like on the order of two orphans, three orphans a day or something on the network. So it's not like a very clear indicator, but it is, it is one of the best we have, because it is directly measuring what we're trying to solve. Uh, I was wondering, is block propagation time bad on its own or just because of its effect on the, uh, the orphan rate, whether noticeable or not? So it's a little bad on its own, independent of the orphan rate, simply because it, um, it, it means that you take longer to see what the status of the network is. But I suppose that if you had a scheme where there was no orphans, there are block uh, propagation, like radical rethinkings of the blockchain that basically don't have orphans, and uh, those would have less issues with block propagation. The, the schemes that have no orphans are schemes that blocks don't form a straight link list. You have this sort of forest of blocks, and then transactions can occur in multiple places in those forests, and there's some arbitration technique for dealing with conflicts. But the problem those schemes have often is they have poor good put, meaning that you're going to end up sending transaction data redundantly maybe many times. A, a high level observation here, this isn't really so much a question, but it seems to be that this business of there being an arbitrary, a mostly arbitrary permutation encoded in a block just kind of blows. It just sucks. It seems like a mistake in the protocol design to. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I, it's something that I'd like to fix, but there is, you know, like. I know in uh, genetics, it's commonly the case that there's all sorts of strange, useless effects that turn out to be vital to life because other things developed a dependency on them. In the case of this arbitrary permutation, it is really nice that miners can just truncate their blocks and get the block they would have made that was smaller. 
people do do that. If uh, we take that away from miners, will they care? I don't know. It, it's difficult for me to get miners to talk about protocol details anyways. They're usually very concerned with being scammed in megawatts. A, li a library <laughs> to support that functionality would be easy. The thing that really sucks is that the dependency ordering it affects consensus, so you can't just change it to an arbitrary other canonical order. Yeah, although you could just require that it be an arbitrary order subject to the dependency graph, which is easy to do inside node software, but hard to do otherwise. Yeah. If I were making a new Bitcoin today, I'd probably allow transactions to be an arbitrary order. There, there are reasons that dependency ordering can be useful, but that's a, cop that's a topic for a off, tape, off stage. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Uh, when you said the, the block population got better with segregated witness, is that because of segregated witness no. or some other stuff that was released at the same time? So it turns out there were um, some large miners that were running things like Bitcoin Unlimited, which was forked from Bitcoin a long time ago, and uh, didn't have compact blocks, didn't have transaction cash, and didn't have da 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 da. So all these things that were going like, ah, orphaning still too high, have to fix it. Uh, <laughs> it turns out that just there was enough miners that hadn't deployed the, the improved software that we're still like eagerly prioritizing fixes to this stuff. And then miners switched to modern Bitcoin core and the orphan rate fell through the floor. So. <laughs> it was difficult to tell that because the pro slow propagation doesn't just cause the miner that's slow to have orphans, it causes everyone to have orphans. So it's not like you could look and say, Ant pool. Ant pool has lots of orphans in. Ant pool is running BU. Aha, it's BU's fault. It wasn't obvious until after the fact when things changed. So we're in a we're in a very stable time uh, as far as network conditions. Uh, but we're seeing in places like Cameroon, Syria, uh, other places, uh, major network partitioning of the internet, mm -hmm. um, and of course uh, firewall China, etc. Is there some way to measure kind of what happens if the, the, the internet becomes a lot more fractured and how do we, how do we become resilient to that? But this is again, I think one of these things that's hard, it's important and it's hard to measure. It's not like the internet in the developed world fractures every day. And so we don't get a lot of data on how durable the Bitcoin network is to partitioning. So I think the answer is we need to overkill it because we can't measure it and it's important. That's why things like our, our Blockstream satellite stuff are, that's an example of overkilling partition resistance, but it's just one tool of, of many. Um, there's more things that people in the Bitcoin community could do with network monitoring and metrics to look for effects like this, but uh, there is a bit of a tragedy in the commons where uh, it's no one's job to run the Bitcoin Network Operations Center, so unless someone like Matt Corello just, you know, it's a wild hair and decides to build something like he built the relay network, we don't collect some of this broad metric data. There's some things like, you know, we can see twitches in Christian Decker's block propagation data. And if there were a wide scale internet outage, we might learn something about Bitcoin's partition resistance. We have reason to believe it's pretty good, um, but there are lots of things that people have reason to believe that turn out to be untrue. Pass the mic up. Um, one of my, my question here is, uh, you mentioned a few times about Macarello's network and how it's been really useful for um, implementing and then iterating on um, these changes. So I'm wondering, what's the difference here between what Matt did with his network and say break test or, or test net? Why, why, why has it provided such huge benefits and why, can't, why can that not be replicated yep. in the normal? Excellent question. So, uh, on all of these tools and techniques, we also did lots of testing in sandboxes, simulated environments. There's some really cool tools in Linux, like dummy net that allow you to simulate latency over networks and packet loss. But the problem with these things is they allow you to deal with the sort of known unknowns. I know I don't know what this does with packet loss. I know I don't know what happens when the, the transaction sets are inconsistent. But what they don't help you with is the unknown unknowns, the vulgarities of the actual network out there. They also don't teach you about user factors. Um, we learned a lot about interacting with miners and like what would motivate them and what kinds of interfaces were useful. 
and uh, how sustainable was manual configuration just by using the stuff in production. So production usage for things like this is no replacement for a test, but a test is no replacement for production usage. And since we did have a way to do it in a pretty safe way, I mean, there's no risk that Matt's relay network like goes crazy and breaks the Bitcoin network. The worst it can do is stop working, and then maybe we find out that, oh, we were a little more dependent on that than we should have been, which is a real risk. Um, but that's the worst it can do. Can there be multiple of them? Oh, yes, there are. So the question is, can there be multiple of these relay networks? And there are, in fact, uh, multiple relay networks. There are some miners that run their own private relay networks between their own data center facilities, and they peer with themselves and friends. I don't know. Right? So um, there's a social dynamics question to say, how well can multiple of these things scale? Anything that requires manual configuration doesn't scale particularly well. And, and Matt would really love it if someone else would run a parallel, well-maintained uh, relay network. It's a labor of love for him. He, he was previously getting donations to fund doing it, and he stopped doing that because the effort to collect the donations each month was more than it was worth. Uh, and it turns out that there are a bunch of Bitcoin miners that like don't want to pay in Bitcoin for things. So, <laughs> like, he had people that only wanted to pay with WeChat, and uh, so he, so he, he stopped collecting donations for it. He pays for it out of his own pocket, and uh, and it isn't as good as it was when he had better funding for it. It was faster before. Are there any more questions? Uh, yeah, a question about compact blocks. Uh, you know, does the default behavior for pre filtered actually still use the Coinbase, or are there like other heuristics to pre filter? Right, so we've tested other heuristics, but right now it just pre fills the Coinbase. So this is compact blocks can send transactions opportunistically, just assuming you won't have them. It always sends the Coinbase transaction because we know you won't have it. You could send other ones, the protocol supports it, Bitcoin Core supports it, but it doesn't do it. I've tested a heuristic that basically works like, uh, if a transaction was surprising to me, I assume it's going to be surprising to my peers. And in the controlled test environment, that would work pretty well. Um, that would be an obvious area for people to experiment with. And then what determines if it's surprising? Hmm? What determines if it's surprising? Like, why oh. it's surprising? Well, it, so I mean, one of the things I have done a lot of is trying to look to see why misses occur in compact blocks. Um, the two most common reasons are the obvious ones. One is that a transaction just arrived milliseconds before the block, obviously, or milliseconds after the block, rather. The other reason that a transaction is missed in a compact block is because there was a um, uh, there was a double spend or mint, and you have the, the different one than the miner confirmed. And uh, we actually address this somewhat in Bitcoin Core. We don't just use the mempool to reconstruct a compact block. We have an additional extra pool that includes double spends and replacements that we keep around for that reason. Uh, probably a bit of a loaded question, but there is like there's some other research going on around the gigabit size blocks. Oh yeah, yeah, gigabyte. <laughs> gigabyte, sorry. Um, but but uh, Craig Wright did 340 gigabyte size blocks two years ago, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, I, so I'd be interested to hear your perspective on that, but then also be interested to hear if you guys have tried any of that yourselves on like Matt's network. Yeah, yeah, well, I, not on Matt's network, but in the private test lab, run this stuff up to enormous size blocks. Like, being able to run large blocks over this stuff is not a surprise or anything like that. It's designed to be able to handle it. The problem with larger blocks is the overall scaling impact on the network, not, not like in my one node on super fast, expensive hardware, keep up with it. Actually, a compact block is a bit better than XThin for that stuff too. This bloom filter that XThin sends adds a non a super linear scaling component and it. it's much worse than uh, the compact block stuff. But yeah, the, the, you can totally you know, run a gigabyte block, but good luck keeping a node that, that's affordable running on that for any period of time. Are there any more questions? We could go to non compact box sort of questions too. Yeah. 
Um, I was wondering about uh, transaction throughput on the Bitcoin network. So I think theoretical it's like 10 or 18 with SegWit, uh, but in practice it's like three. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, can you comment on this? Well, um, right, the throughput depends on what transactions people are producing. So an interesting effect we saw uh, even prior to SegWit is that people started producing much larger transactions. They started doing batch sends. It means that transaction throughput is actually kind of a poor metric in terms of the capacity of the network. So you would actually see the number of transactions processing go down, but the actual capacity of the network in terms of people using it is going up. Um, the other factor, of course, is that SegWit's only being used by about 10% of transactions at the moment. Um, if you're not using SegWit and you care about the transaction fees you're paying, you should use SegWit. It is a massive decrease in uh, fees. So there's a nice incentive to use it, but apparently people are happy paying current fee levels. And I haven't looked today, but in the last couple of days, the, the temple was cleared and found with uh, five Satoshi and byte sort of levels. Um, so it doesn't create a lot of pressure to to use the, use the extra capacity. And this is uh, no accident. Part of the design of SegWit was to avoid creating a system shock by adding a whole bunch of unused capacity, which would collapse fees to nothing, and then cause this fee restarting problem. So it's basically working as well as I could hope it would right now, and that it's, uh, it's, uh, there's an incentive to use SegWit that goes up when fees get higher, and then we get more capacity when there's more demand. Questions? Okay. Well, thank you for your awesome talk, Greg. Thank you.